Books with BJ Media, and I'm finally back to continue uh, reading from Candace Bushnell's Sex in the City. All right, now I have something to tell you. We're supposed to be on chapter eight. I, I know this, but I can't read it. I can't. I can't. It's too graphic for this channel. It is um, about threesomes, and it's also kind of exploitive and gross, and I just don't want to read it. So instead, um, like, it's just not good. It's just, it's just, it's the first chapter I found that I just really don't want to read out loud and have on the internet forever. So we're skipping, we're skipping it. If you really want to read chapter eight, then order the book and read it. But I found it kind of exploitive and gross, you know? Um, so, oh, that was the other thing I was going to, where did it go? Oh yeah, here. <laughs> My cocktail for this evening is a mega pint of tea. <laughs> I don't know what kind of tea, green tea, I think. Um, but uh, coming off of the uh, week's happenings, we just learned that Johnny Depp went through a mega, mega jug of tea phase. And I thought that would be appropriate. If you guys have not been following the live streams that I've been doing, I have been live streaming that trial for eight hours a day. <laughs> for like two weeks now, or no, maybe it's been a week and a half. But I will tell you that um, I've learned a lot. The channel has grown a lot. We have hit 7,000 subscribers. And speaking of, if you have not hit that like and subscribe button and bell, why not? We're having a lot of fun here. And I encourage you to do so. Help me grow the channel so that we can create an even bigger community. After the week that we had, and it was intense, I uh, just got done doing a live stream with my friend, Mary Wojciechowski, who is amazing. She is such a cool, cool chick. Uh, and she did a guided meditation to help us come off of the high anxiety and the bad juju uh, that we all got from watching that cuckoo bananas testimony. Uh, so if you want to go back and watch that, it was really fun. We did gong baths. We did ohm chanting. We did all sorts of stuff. And guess what? Jen from Real Housewives Recaps made an appearance and it was so fun. We did tapping with Brad. And if you don't know what tapping is, you got to check it out. So go back to my most recent live stream and, and check it out. And uh, right before we get started here, I just want to bring to your attention that there is new merch in the merch store. Uh, if you have not seen, you know that I've got the I Survived and Just Like That merchandise in the store uh, with the wine coolers and stuff. You've all seen that. But the new stuff is Mega Pint. Isn't happy hour anytime? Mega Pint me. You can get your own Mega Pint. You can get a t-shirt. It comes in, they come in all different colors and uh, sizes and styles. So check it out because it really does help the show because YouTube keeps demonetizing me. Those rotten bastards. They keep doing it. Every time I put up a video, it just, it just never ends. Okay. Chapter nine, because we're skipping chapter eight, because it's just too, it's too pornographic. I'm not doing that. All right. Number nine. I guess we found my line. <laughs> we found my line. All right. What has two wheels wears seersucker? and makes a sucker of me a bicycle boy. A few weeks back, I had an encounter with a bicycle boy. It happened at a book party that was held in a great marble hall on a tree-lined street. While I was surreptitiously stuffing my face with smoked salmon, a writer friend, a guy, rushed up and said, I've just been talking to the most interesting man. Oh yeah? Where? I asked, glancing around the room with suspicion. He used to be an archaeologist, and now he writes science books fascinating. Say no more, I said. I had already spotted the man in question. He was dressed in what I imagined was the city version of a safari suit, khaki trousers, a cream check shirt, and a slightly shabby tweed jacket. His gray blonde hair was raked back from his forehead, exposing a handsome chipped profile. So I was motoring as much as you can motor in strappy high-heeled sandals across the room. He was in deep conversation with a middle-aged man, but I quickly took care of the situation. You, I said. Someone just told me you were fascinating. I hope you won't disappoint me. <laughs> I bore him off to an open window where I plied him with cigarettes and cheap red wine. After 20 minutes, I left him to go meet some friends for dinner. 
The next morning he called me while I was still in bed with a hangover. Let's call him Horace Eccles. He talked about romance. It was nice to lie in bed with my head throbbing and a handsome man coming it, cooing into my ear. We arranged to meet for dinner. The trouble began almost immediately. First, he called to say he was going to be an hour early. Then he called back to say he wasn't. Then he called to say he was going to be half an hour late. Then he called and said he was, he was just around the corner. Then he was 45 minutes late. And then he turned up on his bicycle. I didn't realize this at first. All I noticed was a more than normal dishevelment for a writer and a slight breathiness which I attributed to the fact that he was in my presence. Where, where do you want to have dinner, he asked. I've already arranged it, I said. Elaine's. His face twisted. But I thought we'd just have dinner at some neighborhood place around the corner. I gave him one of my looks and I said, I don't have dinner at neighborhood places around the corner. <laughs> what a snob. Such a snob, Candace. I love neighborhood places around the corner. When I lived in Chicago, I lived in kind of a rough neighborhood. I lived in um, uh, Rogers Park near the lake, uh, Lakeshore Drive and Green Greenview, Green Greenview and Green Greenleaf. It was one of those. Anyway, on Morse Avenue, right down the street from my apartment, there was a taco place that, oh my God, just thinking about it makes my mouth water. The, the food in Chicago is so good. Seriously, I miss it so much. It's not even funny. But that's the only thing I miss about Chicago. I love little neighborhood places. <laughs> She's such a snot. For a moment, it looked like it was going to be a standoff. Finally, he blurted out, but I came on my bicycle, you see. I turned around and I stared at the offending piece of machinery, which was tethered to a lamppost. <laughs> I don't think so, I said. Mr. New Yorker and his three-speed. This was not my first encounter with a Manhattan literary romantic subspecies I've come to call the Bicycle Boys. A while back, I was at dinner with one of the most famous Bicycle Boys, whom we'll just call Mr. New Yorker. Mr. New Yorker, an editor at that publication, looks like he's 35, even, even though he's quite a bit older, with the floppy brown hair and a devastating smile. When he goes out, he usually has his pick of single women, and not just because these women want to get something published in the New Yorker. He's smooth and a little sloppy. He sits down next to you and talks to you about politics and asks your opinion. He makes you feel smart. And then, before you know it, he's gone. Hey! Where's Mr. New Yorker? Everyone was asking at 11 o'clock. He made a phone call, one woman said, and then took off on his bike. He was going to meet someone. Oh, wait a minute. This is, um, post-it. Burger. Didn't Burger ride a bicycle? Did he? I know he had a motorbike, like he had a motorcycle. One of them rode a bicycle, didn't they? Am I, am I imagining this? Let me know in the comments below. Uh... The image of Mr. New Yorker stealing through the night in his Tweety jacket. Oh, no, it wasn't Burger. It was the other guy, the guy played by Justin Thoreau. Justin Thoreau? Is this last name Thoreau? Yeah. The one who was the writer who uh, was a, was a um, who finished prematurely, if I recall, that was his problem. And his mother was played by, um, it, her name's going to escape me, but, you know, she was super famous. And... She was on the Mary Tyler Moore show. show. Uh, anyway, I think it was him. He was the one on the bicycle. And this sounds like him. Pretentious, Tweety Jacket. Uh, okay. <laughs> the image of Mr. New Yorker stealing through the night in his Tweety Jacket, pumping like mad on his three-speed bike with fenders to keep his pants from getting dirty, haunted me. I pictured him pulling up to the Upper East Side walk-up or maybe a loft building in Soho, Soho, leaning against the buzzer and then panting slightly, wheeling his bike up the stairs. A door would open and he and his inamorata would be giggling as they tried to figure out where to put the bike. Then they'd fall into a sweaty embrace, no doubt ending up on some futon on the floor. The Bicycle Boy actually has a long literary social tradition in New York. The patron saints of Bicycle Boys are white-haired writer George Plimpton, 
whose bike used to hang upside down above his employees' heads in the Paris Review offices, and white-haired Newsday columnist Murray Kempton. They've been riding for years and are the inspiration for the next generation of bicycle boys. Like the aforementioned Mr. New Yorker and scores of young book magazine and newspaper editors and writers who insist on traversing Manhattan's physical and romantic landscape as solitary peddlers. Bicycle boys are a particular breed of New York bachelor. Smart, funny, romantic, lean, quite attractive. They are the stuff that grown-up co-ed dreams are made of. There is something incredibly, uh charming about a tweedy guy on a bike, especially if he's wearing goofy glasses. <laughs> Women tend to feel a mixture of passion and motherly affection, but there's a dark side. Most bicycle boys are married. Or, I'm sorry, back up. Most bicycle boys are not married and probably never will be, at least not until they give up their bikes. <laughs> Why John F. Kennedy Jr. is not a bicycle boy. Aw, miss him. Really miss him. He was, he was something, huh? Quite an icon. Riding a bike is not necessarily a power move, said Mr. Eccles. It's best done by power people like George Plimpton. Otherwise, you have to hide your bike around the corner and surreptitiously take your trousers out of your socks. <laughs> Bicycle boys don't ride their bikes for sport. Like those silly guys you see riding around the park the one in the spandex shorts. They ride partly for transportation. Oh, somebody's calling me. No, it's nobody I know. It's Don't worry, it's spam. It shall not interrupt. They ride partly for transportation and, more important, to preserve a literary boyhood. Think of Twilight at Oxford, riding over the cobblestones while a woman waits down by the Cherwell River, wearing a flowing dress, clasping a volume of Yeats. That's how bicycle boys think of themselves as they pedal Manhattan, dodging cabbies and potholes, while John F. Kennedy Jr. is certainly New York's most famous and sought-after bike-riding bachelor. Well, that's right, he did ride a bike all the time. His rippled athleticism disqualifies him for bicycle boydom, because a bicycle boy would rather bike through Midtown in a seersucker suit than in shorts and a chest-hugging tee. And bicycle boys spurn those skin-tight bike pants that have cushy foam padding sewn into the butt, bicycle boys are not averse to the chastising pain of a hard bike seat. It helps the literature. <laughs> it's funny. I don't own any spandex pants, said Mr. New Yorker, who added that he wears long johns in the winter to keep him warm, which may be one reason bicycle boys, more than their athletic cousins, tend to get physically attacked. The other reason is that they ride at any hour. <laughs> The later, the better, more romantic. One of the dummies. More romantic in any physical condition, anywhere. Drunks roar out of their windows at night and send you into a tailspin, said Mr. Eccles. And worse, one Halloween, Mr. New Yorker was wearing a British Bobby's cape. <laughs> How stupid! Was wearing a British Bobby's cape when he rode into a group of 12-year-olds who yanked him off his bike. I said, I can't fight all of you at once. I'll fight one of you. They all stepped back except for the biggest one. I suddenly realized I didn't want to fight him either. <laughs> the whole gang jumped on Mr. New Yorker and began pounding him until some innocent bystander started screaming and the gang ran away. I was lucky, said Mr. New Yorker. They didn't take my bike, but they did take some records I had in my basket. Note that Mr. New Yorker was carrying records as in vinyl albums, not CDs. Another sign of a true bicycle boy. Mr. Eccles recalled a similar story. Two days ago, I was riding through Central Park at 10 at night when I was surrounded by a wilding gang on rollerblades. <laughs> they were almost children. They tried to capture me in a flank maneuver, but I was able to bicycle away even faster. <laughs> oh my God, have you guys ever been to Central Park? It's beautiful, but scary. It's so big. I rode a bike around Central Park. I rented one when I was there for the the um, Republican. I was covering the Republican National Convention in 2004. And on one of my off, a couple of times I had some off downtime, I went and to Central Park, which is right across the street from the hotel I was staying in. 
And um, I rode my bike. I, I got a bike from the rental. And so, I was like really far away from the rental place. I mean, Central Park is huge. It's huge. And I realized as I was in, I didn't expect it to be so isolated. Like, I felt like I was the only person in the park, which freaked me the hell out. And this was in the middle of the day because I had gone up some road that went into this forested area that was just deserted. Like if I, if someone murdered me, no one would find me for <laughs> days. <laughs> and I started to get really scared. So I'm like, I think I should go back because I'm not even sure where I'm going. And the chain or something fell off the bicycle and the bike no longer worked. And I had to walk this stupid rental bike all the way back. And I had already ridden miles. I had to walk it all the way back to this, to the bicycle rental shop. And I was terrified the whole time <laughs> because I had read the stories. You know, you read the stories about what happens in Central Park, just like what's happening to these guys. Nobody wants that. <laughs> all right. They were almost children. They tried to capture me in a flank maneuver, but I was able to bicycle away even faster. But an even bigger danger is sex. As a reporter, we'll call Chester found out. Chester doesn't ride his bike as much as he used to because about a year ago he had a bad cycling accident after a romantic interlude. He was writing a story on topless dancers when he struck up a friendship with Lola. Maybe Lola fancied herself a Marilyn Monroe to his Arthur Miller. Who knows? All Chester knows is that one evening he call she called him up. And she said she was lying around in her bed at Trump Palace. And could he come over? Trump Palace. He hopped on his bike and was there in 15 minutes. They went at it for three hours. Then she said he had to leave because she lived with someone and the guy was coming home. Any minute. Chester ran out of the building and jumped on his bike. But there was a problem. His legs were so shaky from having sex that they started cramping up just as he was going down Murray Hill and he crashed over the curb and slid across the pavement. It really hurt, he said. When your skin is scraped off like that, it's like a first degree burn. Luckily, his nipple did eventually grow back. <laughs> I didn't realize that they could grow back. A big steel thing between my legs. Riding a bike in Manhattan is indeed a perilous sport. If these writers lived out west, maybe they'd carry guns like something out of a Larry McMurtry or Tom McGuane or Cormac McCarthy. But since they lived in New York, the bicycle boys are more the Clark Kent type, mild-mannered reporters by day who often have to answer to killer either edit editrixes. Oh, we don't use that word anymore. We just say editors. Editrixes, although it's kind of a cool word. It, it signifies the female version of um, editor. But of course, we can't have gendered language anymore. And so the word editrix is just kind of out the window. Uh, they're often mild-mannered reporters by day who often have to answer to killer editrixes. They become menaces to society by night. And who can blame them? You ride through red lights. You ride against the traffic. You can be a felon, said Chester. Oh, this is so true. Bike, bikers never... Bicyclists never follow the rules. I hate them. <laughs> I feel like there's a big steel thing between my legs throbbing ahead of me, said one bicycle boy who asked to be unnamed. I have my hand on my bike right now, said Kip, a literary agent, speaking on the phone from his office. There's a freedom in being on your bike in the city. It feels like you're floating above the masses. I'm pretty fearless on my bike in ways that I can't be in the rest of my life. I feel like I'm the best on my bike, but the most in tune with myself in the city. Bicycle boys are particular about their bikes. They don't usually ride souped up high-tech mountain bikes. No Shimano XT derailers or elastomer suspension forks for them. More typical is Mr. New Yorker who rides a polite three-speed with a basket in the back and fenders. The bike should radiate nostalgia. You have to have a basket for groceries, said Mr. New Yorker. Your computer and work stuff. My bike is definitely like my dog and my baby, said Kip. I kind of take care of it and preen it. But often, when bicycle boys talk about their bikes, it's hard not to think that they're talking about women. I love my bike, and you can get attached to a bike, said one BB. But the truth is that one bike is very much like another. I had one bike that I went completely over the top with, said Kip. It had an aluminum frame, and I hand-stripped it and polished it quite a bit, and then it got stolen. I was emotionally devastated. 
I couldn't get over it until I got a new bike and really made it beautiful. Like girlfriends, bikes are always getting stolen in New York. If you go into a bookstore for 10 minutes, you come out and your bike is gone, said Mr. Eccles. This, however, is not necessarily a problem, as Mr. New Yorker pointed out. The bike pays for itself in three months if you compare it to subway fare, he said. One month if you take taxis. The bike can also be a useful prop when it comes to meeting women. It's a good way to start a conversation, said Thad, a writer. It's also something to fuss with to alleviate your self-consciousness. And apparently it's a good way to tell whether or not you're going to get laid. One time, a woman got mad at me when I proposed riding my bike to her house, said Thad. On the other hand, if a woman says bring the bike inside, it's very sexy. <laughs> whether or not a woman lets you bring your, bi her, your bike into her house is an indication of how well adjusted she is, said Mr. Eccles. If she's anal retentive, she won't want the bike anywhere near her stuff. <laughs> but sometimes, a bike is not just a bike, and women seem to know this. <laughs> One is viewed as a suspicious character. <laughs> You're too mobile and independent, said Mr. Eccles, and certainly a bit undignified in the end. There is something Peter Panish about it, said Kip. That's part of the reason I don't take it everywhere anymore. It implies a certain selfishness, agreed Mr. Eccles. You can't give anyone a lift, and there's little too much freedom associated with a man who rides a bike. Mr. Eccles added that being in his early 50s, there were about ten reasons why he wasn't married, none of them particularly good ones. It can also imply a certain cheapness. One woman, an assistant editor at a glossy men's magazine, remembered a date that she had with a bicycle boy she met at a book signing. After chatting her up, the bicycle boy made a date to meet her up at a nice steakhouse on the Upper West Side. He showed up late on his bike. She was waiting outside, nervously smoking cigarettes. Then, after they sat down and looked at the menu, he said, Look, do you mind? I've just realized I'm really in the mood for pizza. You don't care, do you? He stood up. But don't we have to? She said, glancing at the waiter. He grabbed her arm and hustled her out. All you had was a few sips of water. I didn't even touch mine. They can't charge you for that. They went back to her house and ate pizza, and then he made his move. They saw each other over a few times after that, but every time he wanted to come to her house at 10 at night and eat takeout food. She finally ditched him and went out with a banker. <laughs> the crotch problem. Bicycle boys often make the mistake of trying to turn their girlfriends into bicycle girls. Joanna, a woman who grew up on Fifth Avenue and now works as an interior designer, actually married a bicycle boy. We both rode bikes, she said, so at first it wasn't a problem, but I noticed something was kind of wrong when he gave me a bicycle seat for my birthday. Then, for Christmas, he gave me a bike rack to put on the car. When we got divorced, he took the bike rack back and kept it for himself. Can you believe that? Boys on bikes? God no, said Magda, the novelist. Can you imagine what a stinky crotch they have? <laughs> no, thank you. I've been mowed down too many times by men on bikes. They're all kamikaze, selfish pricks. I, I hardly agree with that. If they have sex the way they ride their bikes, thank you, but speed is not important. Women don't think of riding a bike as, don't think riding a bike is sexy, said Pat. They think it's infantile. But at some point you decide that you can't go through life giving women a false impression of who you are. And that's the end of chapter nine. Chapter 10 is Downtown Babes Meet Old Greenwich Gals. So we will pick up there next week. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry I was gone for so long. The uh, sickness that I had was just too much to handle. Uh, and it, and then the trial just took up all of my attention. And But I'm back to it. So never fear. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for being here. Make sure you check out the merch store and please like and subscribe. I am so excited with the channel growth. It's just awesome and it's all because of you. And I love you guys. I'll see you again soon. Bye.